writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, mystery, and horror, with right now a serial that is meant to be funny <laughs> called Skittles, the Feline um, Colonist to Mars, and some novels I'm working on. Right now you can find the Feline one on my website. I've got to get used to saying this. I'm also now the president of St. Louis Writers Guild. Woo! Oh, God help you all. No. <laughs> we'll and survive. With, and with me today is... Me first. My, uh, uh, my name is Jennifer Stolzer, and I'm a children's book author and illustrator. You can find my things at jenniferstolzer.com. You can see my work. You can hire me to do a children's picture book for you. Graphics, book covers, whatever. I do it. I'm Melanie Claney, and I'd love to do some uh, maybe freelance edit, uh, content editing, but uh, <laughs> no, I don't actually currently hire myself out, but I'm uh, <laughs> writing a fantasy novel, and I also write science fiction and nonfiction. Fedora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, so we're sitting here two presidents. Two presidents. I'll tell you what, we are the summit of writing. Okay. We are all very impressed. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should get the St. Louis Poetry Society president here for, you know. Okay, and today what we're going to talk about is something called the Grim Dark. <laughs> Jennifer, we were just talking about this before we went on air. You've got a great definition for the grim dark. You've got expo- an explanation anyway. Uh, well, you know, forgive me if I don't have all my terms and dates and et cetera correct. Uh, You're grim dark. Uh, the grim dark trend, the grim dark phenomenon, if you would, is the transforming of various properties into what we're going to call a more realistic, uh, but specifically darker tone. So the great example would be the Dark Knight. Uh, I think that started a lot of it. Before the Dark Knight movie, before Batman Beyond, Batman, Batman Begins. Begins, Batman Beyond was awesome. Before <laughs> Batman Begins, Batman Beyond was the tone we were looking at. Kind of dark, but still it's more lighthearted. You know, the previous movie to Batman Begins was Batman and Robin. Batman Forever, I think. Batman Forever. Yeah. One, Batman, 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 one of those two. Point is that the tone was different. It had a more comic book feel, and there, the stakes within that were were not as heavy. Mm-hmm. But when we get to Batman Begins, we see uh, the effects that losing both your parents would have on a young child shown as realistic as possible. And the world that he lives in is grimy and dirty and filthy with crime and people get killed and there's and you get punched in the face and you bruise and you cut. Mm-hmm. And it's it's all very serious. Taken very serious and very dark because it's mostly taking place at night because of Batman. Mm-hmm. But after that, everyone started grimdarking everything. Now we have grimdark Ninja Turtles. We have grimdark Superman. Uh, everything's been... Video games and movies and TV... And books. And, and books have gotten grimdark. And, you know, that's not the way you use the term. It, the grimdark is how you describe something when it has had this happen to but it. But it doesn't have to be a remake. Can it be something new that's grimdark to begin with? I can... I would say yes. Uh, I think a... Like the Hunger Games? The Hunger Games is, is, I don't know if I would call it grim dark. Oh, it's dark, yeah. but it's got, you know, that element of the capital with all the colors and the brightness. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's got the heavy dystopian tone to it. But I would definitely say that something along the lines of, um, I don't know, like... Sin City? Sin City is definitely... Uh, a grim dark tale because mm-hmm. it's very uh, sinuous and, and bloody and everything's mm-hmm. taken very very seriously almost to the point of satire how dark and brooding everything has gotten <laughs> I just wanted to know where you would put some older kind of film that seems to me to be pretty darn grim and dark like Blade Runner what would you do with Blade that? Blade Runner is um, uh, cyberpunk and it is grim dark but I'm, I feel like 
the term, at least as far as I'm using it, as far as I understand it, is kind of how you describe the recent trend in things. So Blade Runner precedes the early 2000s with, uh, I'm going to say, 9-11. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it precedes that. So it existed. It is dark, and it is grim, and it is cyberpunk. And it rains all the time. And it rains all the time. Mm-hmm. And it, visually, it would, uh, it's similar to probably what the people who were grimdark, th- who were making things grimdark, were aiming for when they did this with their movies. It's the, uh, the period of time in which creators of content looked at what they were making and said, I'm going to make a conscious decision to go with this aesthetic. And mm-hmm. that aesthetic would be the grimdark look. And do you think the precipitating event was 9-11? I do. I think that uh, I was actually having this discussion with Kathleen, who's unfortunately not present, and she could uh, she could sound off on this as well. I was uh, comparing and contrasting Babylon 5 and Battlestar Galactica, mm. uh, one having taken place before 9-11 and one taking place after 9-11, and the tones are very different. I would say that Battlestar Galactica would be a grim, dark treatment of the 1979 Battlestar Galactica because they've taken... Uh, something that had a certain amount of fantasy to it, and they said fantasy is not where we are right now. There is fantastic stuff happening because there's a certain amount of prophecy and spiritualism in the new reboot of uh, in the reboot of Battlestar Galactica. But specifically, they looked at it and they said, "No, this real stuff is happening, mm-hmm. and we need to treat this with the level of severity it requires. We are at war. Everyone is depressed and upset." and nursing wounds, and no one is pulling pranks on each other except for every now and then, you know. But the general tone is one of a very serious, you know, it's 9-11 has happened. We have been attacked at home. We should be afraid of a nameless uh, terrorist organization that could get you at any time. Let this sink in. Let this live in you and don't forget about it. That's the tone we're setting for our film, as opposed to... Babylon 5, which also deals with war and a lot of the same sort of themes, the idea of not knowing who your friends are or now, who's I'd working say, against I'm... you. Can Hold on. Okay. Um, the, uh, but the, it took place in a time of relative peace for America because it was mm-hmm. being made by Americans. And in that time, uh, the idea of maintaining peace was the priority. So it was more character-driven. I'm, I'm saying more like tone set the tone was set by we're all in this together we're we're safe and we're happy and then the the there's like a gushy love center in the middle (laughs) of babylon 5 that isn't in the middle of battlestar galactica the middle of battlestar galactica is a cold steely resolute sense of impending doom now i agree that it would be possible to make babylon 5 a good deal darker than it was Mm -hmm. but there were parts of it that were pretty grim i mean it was very shadows well the whole third season was a retelling of 1984 well the the, i'm not saying that putting dark things isn't a recent event dark stuff's been happening i mean we just brought up uh you know the cyberpunk Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blade Runner kind of thing. Yeah, dark stuff. Noir. Mm-hmm. Hey, World Wars. Very dark stuff has happened. It's the way you treat your media. It's the way we view media. That's what grim dark is. It's not a genre. Right. It's more of a tone study. And I love how you're talking about this as it's a post nine eleven event. To be honest with you, um, I'm wondering if this is not a child of noir. And here's where I'm going with it. There was a show that came out. We in the America called it MI5. In Britain, what Britain and the rest of the world, where it was created, was they called it Spooks. Mm-hmm. And the very first episode, this was all about a about a single branch of MI5, one little unit that was anti-terrorism, and would go through their characters' lives, and their characters would die mm-hmm. or disappear or something as the season goes on or series goes on. But the very first episode, you have what looks like to be, to borrow your term from Babylon 5, a little love gushy thing in the middle. You've got um, a mom and dad who are saying goodbye, and here's the little children next to them. Mm-hmm. You see this guy who's in the background, he's walking around, he's dry, it looks like he's picking up trash. Mm-hmm. You've got a woman sitting in a car, and she's um, sitting there watching all this occurring. And in the, in the distance, there's, as these are flashing across, you've got something else occurring where it's, um, 
an informant's warning to talk to talk to her MI5 handler. Hey, something's going on. I need to let you know. As the montage goes, and the woman looks at her card, you find out later she was an abortion doctor. Hmm. Okay, so the kid's wanting to go to work with her or whatever. Husband says, hey, you know, take the car into a fix-it place to take a look at those other things. She starts to pull out. The trash bags this guy's been dropping off is filled with bombs. Ooh. The woman who in the car sets her off her cell phone, which is a detonator, kaboom, mm-hmm. ends up, sorry, spoiler alert, but guys, it's been around for several years. Yeah. Ends up, the mom dies. The daughter is in serious, con- is in critical condition. I'm trying to remember if she dies or not by the end of the series. Mm-hmm. But of oh, that, oh, that very well episode, but that just says beginning. Mm-hmm. And the entire series was written in response well, to 9 11 and eventually the tube bombing, which happened actually in the middle of a series being written. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have, to, I have to wonder is the grim dark, going back to my question, the modern child, if you will, of the noir, ser- noir films, noir books. That came out back at the end of World War II. I'm looking at my mystery fan. My Would mystery you like a history lesson? Because I'm ready to give. Yes, oh, please, please, huh? please yeah. do. Not only that, I'm going to wax real philosophical. Go oh, wax no. philosophical for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> One genre of literature that we have an absolute beginning for mm-hmm. is the Western. Mm-hmm. We know that they started in 1860, just right before the Civil War. Ta-da! Why did they start in 1860? Civil War. Because the Civil War was right there on their doorstep. And what kind of stories were they? What are the characteristics of the old-time Western, the dime novels, the Beatle books, which were about Frank and Jesse James, Kit Carson? Mm -hmm. What are those key points? What would you say they are, Dave? You've studied them, I'm sure. Well, actually, I'm going to pause it for a second and say, if we're just also in addition to the history lesson that we're talking about here, if you ever heard of the term a pocketbook novel, <laughs> this is why, this is exactly where it came from. Because the soldiers will be marching off. They don't have a lot of room in their kit for a book. They have room for a pocket book, a pocket novel. So anyway, um, a lot of the sub- subject matter. Sure. <laughs> going back. What did they do? Well, it was... It in- was Forty to hundred pages. Because <laughs> they weren't any longer than hundred pages. This is true. Usually, there's a lot of gunfights. There was a lot. There's of, action. There's, there's a lot of action. There's a That's lot of action. Part one, exactly right. What else? The themes were usually the lone man versus the um, corrupt, or you know, let's go with the corrupt, either corrupt city government, the corrupt um, sheriff in town. You also had. Um, a lot of what we would today call racist or racism hmm. um, topics. So involved. we had the good guys and the bad guys. You know, right, so that's what I was going with. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, there were, were there clear good guys and clear bad guys? Cause White that, black cats, yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> Even though they weren't necessarily the ones that you would think. I right. Mean, but Frank James is the hero of one, for example. But Grimdark, at least modern time, you know, it seems like, some of the bad guys are bad guys, but sometimes, you know, everybody's a shade of gray and there's not a clear good That's guy very and bad true. guy. But we got a hell of a lot more history to go with. Yeah, yeah. So yeah we're we asked about the war. We started in Western. Yeah, so. yeah, they started with Western yeah, well, because they spawned everything else anyway. Mm-hmm. So we have the good guys and the bad guys, and we have the machinery of government, if mm-hmm. you like, against one poor little person often. Uh-huh. And who prevails? The one little person. The, the little guy. The, the little guy. The criminal uh, <laughs> vigilante. No, <laughs> not, no, not always necessarily. Not always. Kit Carson was a good yeah. guy. Okay, anyway, yeah. you, anyway yeah. you look at him. Yeah. And, yeah. and they fight not only the machinery of government or whoever else the bad guys are, but also they have to fight nature and they have yes. to fight all kinds of uh, wolves and, mm-hmm. and other bad mm-hmm. critters that are out there trying to the get The world is attacking yes. our protagonists. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you see that in everything since. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. it's not just one thing that is attacking our hero mm-hmm. as we continue through a, any kind of mystic journey. Okay. Well, those books thrived for a good 30, 40 years, mm-hmm. all the way up until the turn of the century. When we had 
only foreign wars. Mm -hmm. We had the Spanish-American War, Mm -hmm. and guess what happens right at the end of the Spanish-American War? We get a new kind of Western. Mm -hmm. We get the Zane Grey kind of Western Mm -hmm. then, Mm -hmm. who was perhaps the most prolific and important Western writer ever was. What did he write? He wrote The Riders of the Purple Sage and gave us a different trope, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more domestic, sort of. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's a lot of action still. You've got to have action. Mm-hmm. And yes, there's still good guys and bad guys, but they aren't necessarily huge machineries of government. What kind of connection would you make to this sort of nicer kind of Western than the kind that we had with the real shoot 'em ups and get to it mm-hmm. in the earlier dime novels. What would you say that made? Uh, it's the element of fighting your neighbor versus fighting the other. So yes, that you you sp- feel like you're under a closer attack whenever your civil war is happening. <laughs> right. It was distant. Teddy mm-hmm. Roosevelt used to call it that splendid little war mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because after all. It was over in Cuba, mm-hmm. and we got a lot of good stuff out of it. We got the <laughs> Philippines, you mm-hmm. know. We got Taiwan. We got great stuff from it. <laughs> and so it was a good war. Yeah. I'm going to pause okay. here for just a second. Um, I love where she's going. <clears throat> Before we got to Zangre part, okay. we also had the Lincoln County Wars who were occurring. And what happened there, this is where Billy the Kid came from. Okay. And um, you had literally... The sheriffs versus the marshals, people were made both sides, you know. They were actually fighting for certain landowners mm-hmm. instead of what we would think of today as justice. So it's a mercenary war. It kind of was. And then the government brought in its troops on the side of one of the landowners. So there was as really it always a lot of, did on the side of the uh, non Indians. Exactly. <laughs> then, yes. Then, as you said, we get to the. Um, Spanish-American War, and by the time World War I is getting to roll around, people are excited about going to war. Mm-hmm. So you've totally it's forgotten, okay. except for that nice little war we had in the meantime. Uh-huh. Right. I'm going to turn it back to you. It didn't take long for humans <laughs> to forget what happened in the past. That's so very true. <laughs> well, uh, coming out of World War One and into the 20s, you get... You get people who who spin off of the Western in large measure. You get people like uh, Dashiell Hammett and folks who take the Western in a different area often. Mm -hmm. A lot of them still write Western, too, or give it a shot Mm -hmm. anyway. And so you get the hard-boiled PIs and folks like that. Mm -hmm. And then we have World War II. Mm -hmm. And what does that do to our Western? Urbanizes it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) At the beginning of it. No, no, we, now we go back to Zane Grey. Oh. Because World War II was that devastating. It mm-hmm. really did affect everyone here. Mm-hmm. And so we had Zane Grey knockoffs. We get television series like The Lone Ranger and Sergeant Preston of the Canadian Mounted Police, or mm-hmm. whatever. Well, that wasn't exactly the title. It was something like Royal that. Mounted, something like that. I know yeah, you know, Royal yeah. Canadian Mounted at any rate, those are both straight out of the Zane Grey canon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have nicer westerns. We have singing cowboys. We've got Gene Autry. We got Roy Rogers and Dale mm-hmm. Evans. Well, and we have the kid science fiction when science fiction was made for little kids, and oh. it was the equivalent of Saturday morning cartoon serials. But you also get Gunsmoke eventually. I, I think that was post World War II. I think it's after. It's post World War II. We're coming yeah. into the fifties now. Right. Yeah, and we get a different kind of war in the fifties. Yeah, we do. And Gunsmoke is actually literally almost Philip Marlowe, if you will. It was mm-hmm. been compared to Philip Marlowe, just mm-hmm. set in the Old West. Mm-hmm. Um, you get the Rifleman during this time period as well, which is literally a guy. He would come out. You never saw who he was shooting at at the beginning, but lever action, trigger, lever action, hair trigger. Just going off like you would, like I would shoot a revolver. Mm-hmm. Um, the rifle man, Chuck yeah. Connors. Yes. Yeah. And you get a lot of other um, Westerns, and I'm going to turn this back. Now we're into Korea, I believe. Well, after after World War II, and Korea is another war that's way over there. Uh-huh. And the veterans who came back, like the veterans from Vietnam, didn't get much play, mm-hmm. if any. 
But then they didn't really work all that hard. I knew a Korean veteran who said that uh, it was so boring over there that uh, he would go all for a strike on a cornfield or some kind of field, rice paddy, I guess, uh-huh. <laughs> just to have a little excitement. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I, I confess, really as not a historian, my most of my experience with the Korean War comes from MASH. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah which lasts a long way actual war. So mm-hmm. I, I had I had an uncle I had an uncle over there, so I heard some <laughs> interesting stories. He was also a corpsman, or one who would uh, take care of the dead bodies. Ooh. Yeah, not my favorite type of job. But. Right. So. Okay, well then, in the fifties, we get another kind of war. It is a war which is part of the aftermath of World War II. Mm -hmm. Churchill said that we ought to go after those Ruskies. Nobody believed him, Uh but it ended up being the Cold War. And nuclear devastation, any minute. Uh Any minute those Uh bombs could come and wipe out everything. Yep. And so this spawned, I think, a different kind of of Western, which is the kind of the the Sam Peckinpah version of it, mm-hmm. where there's a lot of blood and guts. Mm-hmm. And also, that sort of crept into other countries, too, and we get the Spaghetti Westerns. Yes. Everyone's chasing and that. they were very gritty and very dark. So it, it keeps on changing with the times, I think. And then we get some more enlightened Westerns as we travel on through the century. And we get uh, some that are gritty, like The Unforgiven, with uh, Gene Hackman a can, and uh, Clint, uh, Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. And uh, it's very gritty and very dark. Morgan Freeman, I think, was in there too, wasn't he? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't uh, either. I thought he was. Oh, good. Go I'm ahead, not go well versed in my westerns. I'm learning <laughs> quite a lot from this. <laughs> and you get the opposite reaction. You get humorous westerns like Three Amigos. Uh-huh. So we get in a, a greater and greater assortment of things. And then, every now and then, we have additional flat flashbacks of one thing or another. It's part of the same idea, I think, of be different but be the same. As in uh, Durango Unchained, mm-hmm. which is gritty and dark and ugly. And at the same time, you get odd little spurs off it. I recently saw a modern spaghetti western, mm-hmm. and it's called... The Revenge of the Gunslayers. Hmm. Okay. But it was Sounds not... Sounds like a what? satire. <laughs> yes, it is. Have you seen it? I have not. not. But you know it's a satire? <laughs> well, like, just from the title, the title, it sounds like a satire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might as well called it uh, The Cowboy Rides to Sunset. <laughs> <laughs> it stars Harvey Keitel and uh, David Bowie, if you can imagine <laughs> this casting. <laughs> and... Uh, Harvey Keitel is an old-time gunslinger, and of course, everybody is out to get his reputation. But this is the late 1800s. His son not only married an Indian woman and has a half-breed son, but also he's a peacenik. He's a peace lover who's never used a gun at all. Then David Bowie comes into town, and he's a typical old-time gunslinger without even an English accent. He, that man reinvents himself. <laughs> Uh, every possible he makes a business uh, of it. Oh, he does. Mm-hmm. He invents himself all the time. And, of course, he eventually gets killed. Here's a spoiler alert. Sorry about that. Mm-hmm. But not by the gunslinger. The gunslinger buried his gun and couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. And, uh, actually, David Bowie's killed by accident by a crazy guy. Oh, okay. So, and everybody dances and has a good time. I feel we ventured away from the actually won't tell us one. So here's this layer we just talked about with the Western. Yes. Yes. Mysteries. Noir. As yes, we talked about home. with um Dashiell Hamill Hammett, uh nineteen twenties, here comes the, there was mysteries kind of sorta of before that. Of course you did have Arthur Conan Doyle, you had Edgar Allan Poe. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um but with the Western, the mystery becomes also the modern Western mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. You get noir movies starting to come out in the 50s, I'm going to say, yeah, in which the whole 40s, idea, yeah, 50s. Uh, in which the whole entire, for example, one movie's idea, and this was across several of them, if you happen to just touch a gun, you are going to be turned evil and be a gun-type, gun 
wielding bandit of some kind. Uh -huh. um, then you get into mod more modern day. I'm really jumping time periods here. Yeah. But the mystery follows the Western in a lot of ways. And now you do have a much more grittier, on the street type um, crime drama, lack of a better way of calling it. Uh -huh. Look at the newest one out there. I'm not sure if I'm a fan of it or not yet, to be honest with you. It's called American Crime. Okay. It is looking at a single crime from all these different angles. Hmm. And it's not pulling punches on racism. It's not pulling punches on the broken down criminal justice system at all. I just can't find a character I actually like in the stories. <laughs> so I find I, a bunch of I find a bunch I can look, so I would <laughs> yeah. love to um, <clears throat> be slap, but there's not anyone who's set. Now science fiction. You get the you go from the very childlike sci fi movies that were out back in the forties and mm -hmm. eventually fifties. You see them get sophisticated more and more. Thank you in a lot to both um, Gene Roddenberry with Star Trek yes. and with George Lucas, especially with tech, technical yes. special effects and so forth. But the storylines yes. are being affected the same way that the Western and that the mm -hmm. mysteries are being affected. You've got the day the world stood still, the first one, not the second one with Keanu Reeves. <laughs> the very first one was about nuclear power. Mm -hmm. War of the Worlds came out. That was movie-wise a reflection of the outside with the nuclear power coming in and destroying. Not the original book, not the um, radio, radio, drama. radio drama, but almost sent everybody into panic. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think War of the Worlds is a really good example just as a kernel of a thing. When are versions of War of the Worlds put out for people? Mm -hmm. They're put out in times that the world that we're looking at is under attack. That's mm -hmm. when they become relevant. That's when they're released, when they will have the most effect on people when they're afraid of being attacked. Mm -hmm. And that's the grim, if you want to, it's the harbinger of the grim dark. you could say. That's where I was going That this it. is yeah. um, the the trend in movies that is grim darking everything. It's, 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 it's affecting modern day movies. It's easier to put a label on than something like noir it's different. It's it, you put it, put a different kind of label on it than you would noir. Noir maybe in uh, thirty years we'll look back on the two thousands and we'll say that was the grim dark era. Perhaps that will happen. Mm -hmm. Right now we're a little too close to it to be able to you know study it in a in a school classroom setting. But uh, there's been such a rash of trying desperately to grab that nostalgic feeling from back before uh, stuff started getting really dark. You know mm -hmm. we're remaking all the superhero movies and we're remaking a bunch of movies that existed back in a time when uh, now it doesn't feel relevant to us anymore. A great example I wanted to bring up would be the RoboCop movie because mm -hmm. they just remade RoboCop like last year or year before. Yep. Uh, they grimdarked it. Mm -hmm. It's a great example because when you go back and watch the, the 80s film, it was about crazy over the top, some, you know, meant to be comedic satire violence. Uh, the police have become machines, but and we're searching for our humanity while we're in there. And but what the the big guys at the top of the tower want to do is make the the police entirely machines, mm -hmm. and then we demonstrate exactly how violent and aggressive and just heartless they are because it blows up the people who are in the boardroom with them. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on a rampage, and our human core robot monster has to save <laughs> us from the pure robot monster. And mm -hmm. they got even sillier as they went on. But the RoboCop, they made a conscious decision when they rebooted RoboCop to grimdark it. Mm -hmm. They didn't want that element of funny, because we are still we are dealing with another rash, a continuing rash, a more public rash mm -hmm. of police and, uh, and authority violence against... You know, Detroit. <laughs> so um, they want. They didn't want to treat it funny. Mm -hmm. This is. We are approaching this from a grim, dark perspective. It, he's gonna kill guys, and it's gonna not gonna be something that we make light of. Killing people is bad, mm -hmm. and he kills people when he needs to. And he's not gonna look funny because he's super serious. Mm -hmm. And he's everything we take in this movie is super serious. So we're gonna make him this sleek, powerful, attractive-looking robot man. And uh, we're going to give him a robot arm for no good reason. <laughs> um, is it, was it a good movie? No, it wasn't. Oh, it was, I liked it, but okay. Well, it was no 
paragon of filmmaking. But then the original one wasn't a paragon of filmmaking <laughs> either. either. So, so yeah. it was on par. I think it's a really good example of the two different time periods presenting mm-hmm. the same ideas. And I'm not going into detail, but another example would be Total Recall. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that went grim dark as well. Mm-hmm. And even though the original version was kind of dark as it, as it was anyway. And it's proof that it's that's the tone set, the, the, that grimy sort of present-day heaviness that a grim dark film would bring to now, it. Now, are we past the peak of grim dark, do you think? I think we are. I'm thinking that uh, audiences are tired of it. I'm going to use video games as an example here. Uh, There was a period of time. We are at the end of that period of time, I hope. We shall see. Uh, It's going to persist just because uh, big business doesn't get a hint. But uh, we, we went through a period of time where every game that came out was a brown war game. Maybe it was a brown game that had cover shooting what in is the future. A, what is a brown war game? Thank you. It's a war game that's brown. Hello. Everything was brown. <laughs> it took place Not in a black. desert. <laughs> Not black? No. No. Everything's okay. brown. No, brown is a realistic color. Yeah. Brown has dirt on it, and everything yeah. has dirt on it in real life. So the walls are brown, the floor is brown, the costumes are brown. Call of Duty is what I'm hearing. Call, you know, Call of Duty. Uh, even I'm going to go into Gears of War. Gears mm-hmm. of War, everything was slate gray and muddy. Uh, it took place in the future against aliens, but it didn't matter. It, it, to someone, to an uneducated person, if you put up a frame of Call of Duty and a frame of Gears of War, they wouldn't know which game it came from. <laughs> they would assume that one was a level of the other. It was The genre was very tone deaf uh-huh. because everything had been grimdark. Everything had been given the same aesthetic treatment and made it look really real and gritty and visceral. But after a while, you get tired of looking at the same thing over and over again, and people are craving new stuff. And we're still trying to figure out what that new stuff is. It's sort of veered into indie territory, where people said, you know, all this modern stuff, it's all boring. I'm going to remake Mario Brothers. I'm going to make it with a different animal or something in charge. Going to nostalgia. Just whatever made you happy. People are trying to make stuff that make them happy because they're tired of being depressed all the time. Just today, I saw a parody of Jurassic Park made with Legos. I forget what it was called, but I mean, again, this this was. It it took three months to make. uh, It took uh, three sets of Legos. Mm -hmm. No, by three sets. One of the sets was worth forty thousand dollars. Was a lot of Legos. You know, Mm -hmm. another one of those Legos was an eighty thousand dollar collection. So you know, it took a hundred thousand dollars of Legos to make this movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But so, so trend is grim, dark. Sounds like it's trying to go away. So it's going away because people are tired of feeling bad. That's my that's my theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's also because of sameness and people. The reason why grim dark started is because the effect in the world that. And, you know, pre-9-11, that kind of general feeling that everyone felt kind of safe and everything mm-hmm. was going to work out, that wasn't the way the audience felt anymore. The audience was actually scared. The audience was, we have to circle the wagons and rally and pull together because it's dark out there. And yeah, then, she went western on I went story. western on you. Um, and so they made films to answer that audience need mm-hmm. because the audience wanted to see stuff like Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. They wanted to see that... In the, the real, dead. yeah, you know, it, zombies are very, you know, got very popular through the grim dark section because it it is a blending of that sense that society is collapsing and we're out for ourselves and we have to uh, face the harsh realities of real life and things are covered in blood and dirt. Zombies. I will see maybe Game of Thrones as a transition. <laughs> it's I, Game of Thrones. I'm not going to say Game of Thrones is grim dark because it's, no, but it's still dark. And it's it's dark. It's dark, and, but it is. I mean, I think you're, you have yeah. a good point. There's a reason why it's so popular now. It's because there's a certain level of fantasy and and mm-hmm. reward and overcoming things that isn't necessarily present in the grimmest of darkest grim dark stuff. I think in the world of literature, which of course the world of movies and television follows, mm-hmm. there 
are actions and reactions. There are swings and trends. Mm -hmm. And if somebody finds a trend that they think is working, like a Harry Potter, for mm -hmm. example, then you're going to get Percy Jackson and another mm -hmm. dozen kinds of imitators. <laughs> I don't know that that's a bad thing, but I know that it doesn't take too awfully long before you reach the saturation point. Exactly. And then they're out looking for something new again. Uh -huh. And the lesson for writers in that, if there is, one is that you probably are not going to catch any of these waves. No. Well, no. a good hint is if they're making movies about it, the trend is over for books. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, um, so. uh, I'm going to pull an example from a completely other place. Uh, my younger sister, who loves the grim, darky, deep, nasty stuff, where she works as a cake decorator and makes <laughs> children's cakes. Uh, but she always says that if she has to, if she puts something on a first birthday cake for one of her clients, because she serves or her specialty shop uh, serves a more high society St. Louis clientele than other you know specialty shops. We're here next to the local MacArthur's Bakery, and they'll make you know stuff for more of middle middle class level stuff. You know, mm -hmm. young mothers, things like that. These are the you know the Gucci brand dog in a bag kind of ladies it's like if she make if she puts something let's say mustaches she puts a mustache on a first birthday cake for one of her clients that trend is dead <laughs> if it has reached that strata and become popular at that part they are not on the cutting edge it is done then <laughs> and the fact that everyone is now tired of grimdark everyone knows what a zombie is. Uh, when uh, The Walking Dead started on television, zombies were more of a niche thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And now, you know, walk, you go anywhere and you see zombie things, you know, there's zombie runs and zombies on TV and zombie video games. And you, I asked, if I went to my grandmother and told her, you know, asked her, do you know what a zombie is? I bet she'd know. And she's totally out of touch. <laughs> But you see, they gave, they gave them something they could slap on their lunch boxes mm -hmm. and create dolls for and merchandise, merchandise, and merchandise. Yes. Yeah. And that's the oversaturation effect, which I interrupted you to talk about. So, were you going with <laughs> oh, like, what well. was your original concept, <laughs> Fedora? I'm sorry. The original concept was to warn people against this bandstand kind of effect and to instead go for something original that you haven't seen just because. Anne Rice became popular uh, after vampires had been popular in earlier times, mm -hmm. like in the 60s and mm -hmm. in the 30s. And the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, it kind of comes around mm -hmm. and goes around. That, And then, of course, we get the Stephanie Myers one. And if you're going to do vampires, you're going to have to do them some other way that has been done. The same old, same old isn't going to work. It is funny you should say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I wrote a vampire novel, and I didn't do anything with it. Um, I kept on working on it, working on it. I came close to doing a, trying to sell it out there. And, of course, out came Stephanie Myers with her spiral, what, spiral? Yeah. With her sparkly vampires. And I was just like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <clears throat> if, all the if all the girls think all vampires should be sparkly, this is never going to work. So I've been re-looking at rewriting it from beginning, completely from beginning. And I'm looking at an old Russian fairy tale. And it's funny that you said, you know, you got to look at it from different angles with vampires and all that. that. That's exactly what I'm having to do right now. I don't want to give out too much except for say mm -hmm. it's a little bit based on the deathless, but it's gone beyond that um, fairy tale. But well, it was originally, you know, a, a, a metaphor mm -hmm. for those blood-sucking people out there who take advantage of mm -hmm. the poor folks, mm -hmm. the peasants and the like. So it was a morality tale. But it's caught on as an adventure tale. Right. Yeah, and I I personally, from a biology point of view, like the idea that the the original version of vampires was a lot closer to what we think of as zombies now. But if you look at some of the... Not Dracula, before Dracula. like in Okay. The uh, folklore vampire. Thank folklore you. I was, like, I was looking like, what? Yeah, no. No, you didn't see the look on his face, but yeah. he, he was confused. Yeah, <laughs> well, but, yeah I, was about to, I was about ready to jump in and start to have no, a throwdown with but, him. But, anyway. <laughs> but before... Pre-Dracula vampires. Okay. But point is, the those vampires, if you go back far enough, their symptoms match rabies reasonably well. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but... I think uh, the vampire is a good way to map the idea, you know, spinning off of the idea of grimdark. I mean, we started talking about grimdark, mm -hmm. but really we're talking about responsive media. 
take the vampire, the way the vampire has changed compared to what Melanie just mentioned versus uh, Sparkle Pyre's uh, <laughs> Stephanie Meyerland. Uh, that's I'm a big change. <laughs> I cannot... I cannot claim Sparkle Pyre. I read that somewhere else, but it's now we can use that term from now on. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, whoever thought that up, A+. Plus. Um, but the the iterations that the vampire has gone through, mm-hmm. uh, it, was, it was something that was responsive to the world that they were seeing, the idea of a monster that is made out of a man, or a more powerful man. You know, like when... Uh, Count Dracula was super popular, but no one was talking about vampires when Dracula came out. Dracula became kind of the template for vampires uh-huh. because he was this suave, uh, sophisticated. rich, sophisticated. He was rich. He was a little bit. I'm trying to remember from the original book. He was a bit less. He was a bit more. He uh, was, he was a foreigner. Yeah, he, he was a cut. foreigner. He, he was, was a sinister. mysterious foreigner, but he also had a magnetism to him. Very yeah. much so. And he had a power over people, which is the True. scary part. And it wasn't a power over people like rabies has a power over yeah. people. <laughs> it was more of a social thing. And that was a transformation that was response to the times. Because, you know, mm-hmm. I, people who know more about history than I do, I mean, what was happening in England at the time? The Industrial Dracula Revolution. Out, it's, it's a lot of change is happening. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, rich people, taking over things. And, and I, I've heard a commentary on Dracula. The movie wasn't so much sci-fi. Well, I mean, it wasn't so much a horror as it was a Which technology. Movie? Uh, not movie, book. The okay. original book, <laughs> Dracula. I was like, there's movies of Dracula. Sorry. Yes. Like, the original one? book, Dracula, it was all about technology. Because mm-hmm. they used the typewriting machine yeah. and the, yeah. the recording voices. Yes. With the, you know, and, <laughs> well, and along with it. Um, Jekyll and Hyde, I think, was being written about the same time period. A little bit earlier. A little bit earlier. Oh, the 1860s, so, 70s. Yeah. So a birth like of that. horror, a birth of and, dark stories uh, at about the same time. Frankenstein was about the same era that people were no, experiencing a lot of fears. 1830s, I think. Mary <laughs> I thought, I thought Mary right. Shelley knew um, <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde, uh, the author of Jekyll and well, Hyde. Well, certainly she might have, because okay. she was just a child when she wrote oh, Frankenstein. Okay. Yeah, she was 19. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, well, and... Literally, the European continent was becoming dark mm-hmm. at that particular point in time because of all the cold smoke that absolutely choked you and made the rain rain dark stuff on you. Uh-huh. It was literally becoming dark, so it's not surprising, I think. So that was a that was a temporal grimdarking <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Uh, and there were wars too. I yeah. should say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's uh, let's jump forward in time to to Anne Rice to okay uh, to into like the vampire Lestat mm-hmm. to the but seven vampire. The vampire Lestat is a very different vampire than Dracula, and what was happening at the time of, of those books. I mean, we're looking at a lot of social change in mm-hmm. America at that time. Post Vietnam. Exactly. And specifically, a lot of uh, of social change in, like, you know, it's 60s and 70s, uh, free love and mm-hmm. and rights, people looking for their rights, and a lot of the common man rising up against uh, society. Well, uh, Lestat and Louis are not a very thinly veiled homosexual relationship. No. <laughs> <laughs> they are the vampire of that time. They're, they're prime, but we are given their point of view. That book was written in response. It was showing the darkness of the world they're looking at, and they're, it was written in a way that the people who were reading it at that mm-hmm. time could relate to it because they were kind of on that side. We wanted the heroes to be the vampires. We wanted to live through them. We wanted to support their cause, even though they were dark and misunderstood and evil. Well, the quote, misunderstood is why definitely we to, misunderstood. Yeah. But that's what that that was what the society was telling so many of those people what they were, mm-hmm. and you know, those people being the readers of that time period. Um, fast forward again to uh, Twilight. What are vampires now? Vampires are tragic boyfriends. <laughs> They're tragic, no and and they're uh, they're completely stripped of all of their power because we're supposed to accept these vampires. In it was written for uh, young, you know, girls. I mean, it was, it's girl literature. It was written for girls who uh, were looking for the bad boy but wanted to be protected. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's written for a time period in a human's life that there's a lot of fear, but it was taking that fear and making it less scary. 
And for very Is good reason. Is that a good idea? Well, <laughs> it sold well. <laughs> the, From a marketing point of view, yes. Yeah, so this, is, this is a post-9-11 thing. Mm-hmm. They're trying to help people, you know, vampire fans, girls who feel misunderstood, uh, boys also, I'm sure, also read Twilight, feeling like they are kind of the outside person, but that the whole world is against them, that it's a very dark world they live in and they need some light. So their vampire reflects the light and sparkles now. But because the vampire has to be a safe place you can go. Because it's all you've got. The rest of the world is going to chase you down and hunt you and give you all sorts of school drama and judge you if you don't have a date to the prom and all these things that girls worry about that seem really, really dangerous. Well, that's a reflection of how the whole world feels. Let me mention another author that I like better than Stephanie Myers, <laughs> and that's uh, Neil Gaiman. Yes. And... There is similarities to the uncertainties of the world and mm-hmm. not knowing what's going on, but he deals with it very differently. And that's also uh, along with Terry Pratchett. Yeah, yes. Terry Pratchett. Oh, Terry Pratchett is a great way to explore religion because you know he's an he's an atheist, but he puts forward his religious ideas through his books very interestingly, and it's much less non. It's much less threatening when it's in an alternate universe, and you can just explore the ideas mm-hmm. when. The world really is it flat and supported by a turtle. <laughs> yeah, and so was JMS, the one who created Babylon 5. Mm, Joe yeah. Michael Straczynski. Thank you. I, I, never, I never want to mispronounce his last name. Straczynski. Thank you. <laughs> I respect him too much to mispronounce it. He's a sweetheart. He's a, he, he don't, well, if I've learned anything from being a Babylon 5 fan now, don't prank Joe Michael Straczynski. <laughs> <laughs> he gets back at you yeah. months later. <laughs> Your teddy bear may be out in space. It will be in space, Peter David. <laughs> Uh, but yes, so I have a question about Neil Gaiman. Yes, I've never read a book of his until right now. I am reading Stardust. Oh, oh what a sweet one. book! Well, I haven't read that one. one, and and I was saying this is fantasy. This is fairies. Mm-hmm. This is find a star. Uh-huh. You know? mm-hmm. It just doesn't sound like anything that Neil Diamond talks Neil, about. Neil on Gaiman. 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 Yes. Yeah. Well, talks about on what, TV. So what? what the thing is, he writes going? very different types of books. He writes a lot of different books for a lot of different audiences. I want to be him one day because Neil Gaiman <laughs> wakes up one day and says, "I would really love to write a script for Doctor Who," and calls his agent. And they say, "Sure, go for it," and he does, and it's fantastic. And then the next morning, he wakes up and says, "I want to write a picture book for children," and he does, and he calls his agent, and they're like, "Yeah, we'll sell it," and he sells it, and it's fantastic. Yeah. I want to be Neil Gaiman someday. <laughs> uh, but he's written like oh. Uh, American Gods, that's one he's known mm-hmm. for. Uh, Nancy Boys, which is sort of the se- kind of sort of the sequel to American Gods. He wrote with with Terry Pratchett. Mm-hmm. What was Good the Omens. Good Omen. Good Omen. Good, good no. Omens. Good, good Omens. Good Omens. Instead yes. of telling me these titles, which um, means nothing. What are they? Let me, they let me like? use Good Omens. I, Go I ahead. Love, good Omens is a good example. I love Good Omens with my from the bottom of my heart. Good Omens is all about the end of the world. The child of Satan has been born. He comes out, and somehow someone loses him. Yes. Nobody knows what family he went home with. He gets swapped at the at the hospital. At, at the <laughs> hospital. And the demons are, of course, to try and find out where he's at so they can start the end of the world. Well, actually, they think they know where he is. Yeah, they but just they have the wrong baby. We're, we're given the... We're, we're, we're synopsising at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and the four horsemen have been released. And, by the way, Pestilence is replaced with pollution. <laughs> and they ride motorcycles. Yes. And one of my favorite scenes in this entire thing with the Four Horsemen is Death. Death is at, I forget if he's at a bar or if he's at a casino. Something. I think it's a bar. I think it's a bar as well. It's like and, a dive. And he's playing a video game. The video game is a trivia game. It's like, in what year did the Black Plague occur? How many deaths occurred from this? And he's getting everything right. And money's just piling up, piling up, piling up. Mm-hmm. People are around and go, oh my God, watch this guy, watch this guy. And finally he gets to this question. In what year did Elvis Presley die? He just stands there. <laughs> Everybody's going, anybody knows that answer? It's whatever. He goes, I didn't take him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's stuff like that. You get... Um, it talks so about... So it's funny. It's funny. Oh, it's very funny. They all, it, it they all, they all write a certain, uh, it's certain comedic... It's all very dark comedy most of the mm-hmm. time. Um, I think it's important to note, since we're talking Neil Gaiman and Neil Gaiman's uh, uh, backlog, what would mm-hmm. you call his... his backlist. Backlist, thank you. 
I was looking for it. Uh, he's written in a lot of different time periods mm-hmm. of American and European culture, being from both sides of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see that reflected in a lot of the choices he makes and when he decides to write things that he writes. Uh, nowadays, he's writing a lot more uh, children's mm-hmm. and uh, comics and television. Uh, but, you know, he started off writing full-length novels for adults, and it and you know, they were grim. Were they, they were everything is always. Uh, and I guess everything is being a little too broad. Yeah. Uh, but he he does like to skew toward a either a dark comedy. But he always has dark elements in it. Even in his children's books, like he wrote a children's book about a graveyard. Oh yeah, the graveyard book. Yeah, I read so, that one. And it's it's got children's themes in it, and it's about growing up. But it's also got that dark element because Neil writes the dark element. That's what he likes. Yeah, mm-hmm. in chapter one, a, bo- a baby's entire family is killed, and then the baby crawls into the uh, graveyard and is raised by ghosts. And, okay. Interesting premise. And his, pop, his popularity has taken hold mm-hmm. uh, in our culture because that's kind of the grim place that we all live in. But you know? with touches of humor. With touches no, of humor different. because you can't be sad all the time, <laughs> otherwise they won't fund your show anymore. <laughs> Good point. On a side note to everybody out there, if you haven't seen this already, I recommend that you watch... Neil Gaiman's uh, commencement, commencement, yeah, commencement speech. My throat, my mouth is dry. <laughs> commencement speech, two thousand and twelve. And all I'm going to say with this is, if you're ever struggling with your writing, listen to it. If you feel like you're going nowhere, listen to it. A lot of Christians, and I assume other religions as well, but a lot of Christians will have what they call daily readings from the Bible. This speech <laughs> should be your daily reading from your writing aspect. Yeah. And with that, I turn this back to our original topic. <laughs> Grimdark thing. We're get back to Grimdark. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Nora. Um, I am often turned off by the very opening sequence of any kind of movie when they show somebody getting beaten up and blood all over and everything. I just go, uh, <laughs> I don't want to see it. And I wonder if that is a normal reaction <laughs> or if it is because I've seen too much. What is your take on that? Are you bored? On how much is too much? Are you I'm, bored no, by seeing I'm disgusted. it? I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. I think, um, is that something that you were watching before that didn't bother you and it has become disgusting? I think it doesn't. I think starting out with it disgusts me to the point that I don't want to You like to build up to it, it if it's there. Yeah, right. I can stand it if it's later on and if it's if it's warranted in some fashion. When you just get blasted into it first off, I think, ugh. See, you've got the problem. And I, it's not just related to what I would call slasher horrors. But it's, it's where you see it most, I'll see it a lot at. Mm. But it has gotten into the fiction. And that is, it's blood and gore for blood and gore's sake. It doesn't really right. serve the purpose. It's yeah. grim and dark, though. Yeah. yeah, well, the horror genre suffered a lot from the grim dark trend. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, horror movies were, I mean, we could say Stephen King horror movies, but there was a certain amount, like, the villain of your um, horror movie before 2001 was, mm-hmm. like, Freddy Krueger. He comes mm-hmm. at you in the dark, and he's in your nightmares, and he kills you, and, you, and then you're, he's tracking you down. Or, uh, or like, Jason Voorhees, mm-hmm. where he's a... Uh, He's pursuing you, but he's slow and plodding, and he's going to be real violent when he catches you. And the scary part is that even though he's slow and you think you've got him on, you know, you know where he is, he'll come out of the side door. Mm-hmm. You, you know, he'll get you when you aren't looking. And that's, that's a tone thing. The tone there is the creeping dread. Mm-hmm. And a more grimdark, splatterpunk, uh, p- torture porn, gore fest kind of movie like Saw. Perfect which, example. Which came out fairly recently. When was the first Saw movie? First Saw movie came out... It was after 2001. Out, yeah, I it was like that. early 2000s, mid-2000s. I would say mid to, mid-2000s mid to late... between two thousand. It was sometime between 2005 and 2010, just by place, by placing it in my head where I'm in, when I was seeing it. Yeah. yeah, the first Saw movie started this sort of torture porn thing. Uh, specifically, it was created because they didn't have a lot of budget, mm-hmm. and the whole movie is shot in one room, right? And probably over a weekend with limited effects, you know. 
Uh, it's so got you're a saying small that's cast. Just play bad. Is that what you're saying? It's not. Well, it's not my type of movie. I'll confess. I haven't actually watched a Saw movie all the way through. I was treated to a Halloween clip show of Saw highlights once when I was in high school. I guess. Uh, probably in college, if we're looking mm-hmm. at when these movies were made. I'm not that young. I'm young, but not that young. <laughs> um, and uh, I have a bit of a needle phobia. I don't like needles. And I was shown a clip of a woman jumping into a tub of used hypodermic needles. And I said, never, ever, ever am I watching these films. <laughs> so if the films are good and I have missed out on something fantastic, I apologize. I'm what? speaking about them from an outsider's perspective. Well, I saw the but, first one. Like, I refuse to ever see, see the next one again. <laughs> And it was because of two reasons. One, I don't... Oh, 2004 is when the first one came oh, see, out. See, there you go. Mid, I was, mid-2000s. Yeah, I was, just, I was off by one year. Um, I would, that was the year I graduated high school, so there yeah. you go. The one... I've seen a lot of real violence in my life. Mm. Seeing it gratuitously on a screen... Gratuitously? Uh, yeah, sort of a mouth dry. Yeah, it was all right. Gratuitously on the screen doesn't exactly excite me. Mm-hmm. Actually, it... Like Fedora, and okay, doesn't it's like I don't want to see it get out of here. And number two, is, I knew who the bad guy was within five minutes of the movie, maybe ten. Uh-huh. I'll give it that long, and to find out how right I was at the end was a letdown rather than anything else. So I never saw another one. No, well, well, there were many of them. Yeah, I know <laughs> they got up to six. I think. Yeah. Last one was Saw 3D. Mm-hmm. And that this movie I'm bringing up specifically because from a, a historic movie making perspective, uh, this was when the world was exceptionally tired of Saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was tired of Saw because at this point it wasn't scary anymore. We'd become overwhelmed with the gore. And at that point, everyone was looking forward to the next paranormal activity movie. Yeah. <laughs> which is a very different or the kind. Next, mm-hmm. Or the next Twilight movie. Well, I wouldn't call Twilight horror. a horror movie. Uh, but would. when you're going to when you're going on Halloween night to watch a movie, and it was go see the new Saw movie, yawn, or go see the new paranormal activity movie, oh boy, the last one was really good, let's see this one, it'll scare me too. Uh, then they chose that because we become exhausted. We, the viewing viewership, mm-hmm. have become exhausted of the that body gore. The paranormal activity phenomenon is now fading because everyone's tired of that. Yes, we're really tired of staring at an empty screen to get a jump scare every <laughs> thirty minutes, and we've seen through the veneer. Yes. Yeah. Um. I don't think this ever went in... Well, I know this movie never went into a series, but I don't think they've made too many movies of this because I think it revolved on a twist. But um, the I think it was The Others. Mm. It had... Oh, she was married to Tom Cruise. Nicole, and Nicole, Nicole Kidman. Kidman was the star. But That was um, a good movie. I... Uh, I didn't find it scary, but the person I saw it with found it scary. In fact, she almost bruised my uh, arm by grabbing it <laughs> so much. It's a ghost movie. Yep. So. Yep. Um, I, I was just thinking about low budget things, and uh, sometimes you can get them to make work one time only. Yes. Like Blair Witch, Witch Project. Project. Yes. yes, just wanted to bring that up. And Blair Witch. Project. I can't stand another jerky. I think this means <laughs> that we need to that. have another talk about horror genre. There's so much uh, to uh, yeah, attach with the horror genre and the evolution of the horror genre. We brought up zombies. I would bring my sister in for the zombie talk because she loves zombies so much. She'll probably talk about mustaches as well. <laughs> so, but back to the grim dark. Mm-hmm. Take us back full circle. Indeed. Um, well, there is a TV show, saying, Grim. You know, yeah, that's, that's, about, that's really that's a grim. That grim is a grim is counts because it's a grim darking of fairy tales. Well, yes. true. It turned it into a it. crime drama. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with the um, grim. Darking, sorry, got a message here. Uh, With the grim darking, I was just having to think of the TV show Shield mm-hmm. was also thing. What you made me think of with the Blair Witch Project, it was a constant jerky moves type thing, <laughs> which is what yeah. Shield. They it was treated like they're like you're actually standing there and the camera's going all over the place. Yeah, waiting for the little Pell Cam police movies. That's <laughs> about to come. Um, <laughs> but is grim dark dead or is it about to be evolved? That's going to be an interesting question. Well, Grim Dark as a phenomenon is stopped becoming a phenomenon and started becoming a normal. So it's going to change no matter what happens because people are tired of it. That's what I think. I think that it's going to evolve because it has to or else people will stop buying movie tickets to go uh-huh. see it. It's evolved already into sort of the explodo hyper action fests and the 
<laughs> um, like the we spoke about Taken last week mm-hmm. uh, into the Taken style movie of you know vigilante justice kind of thing, where it's gone past being grim dark, which is super realistic and gritty and bloody and muddy, and into it's become fantastic again. Uh, fantastic violence. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I think that's going. And the lapel cam cop movie. I'm sure is on its way, probably already currently in pre-production. Um, if not, some some fan listening to our listen to this. Please old... go ahead, just yeah. cite us in the end credits. Uh, but the um, like that's coming because that's the way the world's turning, mm-hmm. and that's what people are thinking about, and what people are interested in, and that's always going to drive what comes out. Yeah, uh, drone movies. Yes, mm-hmm. the, these things are happening. Now, it takes longer for a big budget film, you know, for big companies. I said that at the very beginning, to get the picture that we're tired of it, that's why we get tired of it. So, uh, I guess, I think that Grimdark is evolving, and it's going to evolve into something else. And may, I wonder what the period of time will be when we go to film studies class in 50 years and see when we study the Grimdark, so, you know, uh-huh. period what the beginning and end of it's going to be, because I don't think we've seen quite the end yet. And then it can flash back again, because (laughs) we do get more variety with every new trend and possible flashbacks to everything as well. It's like a drug or bad drug. (laughs) And with that note, thank you for listening to Right Pack Radio, and join us next week for another interesting topic in the writing industry. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Music